I'll tell you, this church prays. This church prays. First reading comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting. Clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, Shout! I asked, What should I shout? Shout that people are like the grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the Sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, He brings His reward with Him as He comes. He will feed His flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in His arms, holding them close to His heart. He will gently lead the mother's sheep with their young. And our second reading comes from Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, someone is coming soon who is greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise Praise God. God. Amen. So we're in the second week of, of Advent, and Advent is all about preparation. It's all about getting ready, about preparing ourselves for the arrival of God in our life. And I, I think that these two readings are, are perfect for today. They, they prepare us for the arrival of Jesus just 17 days away. Seven, 17 shocking days away, so <laughs> get busy. Because Addie's waiting. <laughs> now, I, I referenced both of these readings last week, and, and I thought we should get a little bit deeper into them this week. Because it talks about John the Baptist who led the way for Jesus. Just like we can lead the way for the arrival of Jesus in other people's lives. I also see... Christians, today's Christians, in these readings. In the first verse of Isaiah, the prophet gets a directive from God to comfort his people. He says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, what would give anybody a lot of comfort? When you think about it, what brings comfort to you? Having all your bills paid? Mm. Having a job you love? World peace? No presidential election commercials? <laughs> <laughs> that would bring me a lot of peace. And they haven't even started yet. And I believe that true peace would come to somebody if they knew that all their sins were forgiven. And that they knew where they were headed. Wouldn't that bring you a sense of calm to know that no matter what you've done that you can be forgiven if you just ask Jesus into your life and say 
I repent. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. That's the message that God is, is telling Isaiah today. He's saying, you have this great gift. Give it to people. In people, you have this great gift available to you. Just take it. Just like that slide says, God gives it to us freely. We don't have to do a thing. We don't have to be perfect to get it. We just have to say, Lord, save me. And that's, that's all he wants. But there's one other thing we need to, to hear. He says sin. Now we know in, the, in our study of the Old Testament, Bible 101, that the Israelites, like us, they sin over and over. And we're getting into numbers, and that's what we're really going to see. Sin, repent, repeat, over and over again. But here God says sin. Singular. He wants us to know that there's only one unforgivable sin. And that's when we turn our back on Jesus. So as we prepare to, to receive Him this Christmas season, we have to make sure we're really bringing Him in. That there's nothing between us and Him. And Jesus tells us the same thing in Mark. Mark chapter 3, verse 28. He says, Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins. And every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, that will never be forgiven. They are guilty of the eternal sin. Now, what, what Jesus is saying is, when you, when you turn your back on the Holy Spirit, what you're doing is, you're turning your back on the Holy Spirit's witness that Jesus is Lord. So basically, you're saying, Jesus, I don't need you. And of course, that's the only unforgivable sin. When you turn your back on Jesus, there's nothing left. Be empty. Here's what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit in John 16. He said, when the Helper comes, he will show the world the truth about sin. That's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit, to convict us of our sins. He comes to us and all of a sudden we go, oh yeah, what I'm doing, so that's not right, that's not good. He will show the world about being right with God. How we get into a right relationship with God when we say, Lord Save me because I can't save myself. And he will show the world what it is to be guilty. Once again, convicted of sin. He will show the world about sin because they did not put their trust in me. For our sins to be forgiven, we have to come to God. And that's basically what God's saying in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. He says, now look at this. He says, come now, let's settle the matter. Because once you ask for forgiveness, it's done. God says, flat out, let's settle this matter. Let's get it done with. This is all you have to do. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, totally wiped out. Let us settle this matter. To come to God and to make it easy for others to come to God, you've got to remove all the obstacles. In verse 3 of today's reading from Isaiah, we hear a voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Out in this wilderness that our people are living in, they don't know where to turn. We've got to make it easy for them. We've got to pave the route. We've got to knock down the mountains, fill up the valleys, and make a straight aisle for them. Think of the time you might have been invited to come to worship. You had obstacles in your way. You had things telling you, I don't want to go. I don't want to go into that place because it's scary. The church is a scary place for some people who don't know what goes on here. We have to make it easy for people because once they step through that door, they see all your friendly faces and they see how you react when they come in and then there's no turning back for them. But we have to make a straight highway for them to come through that front door. Remove all their fears. Mark tells us the same thing in his reading. But he's also talking about us. In Isaiah 40, we, see, we hear, Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill made low, and every uneven ground shall become level, the rough places of plain. It tells us that right now there's no highway to God, but we can do that. We can make that highway. All we have to do is to believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior and repent. And that's the highway. 
the sins and everything else we do, that's the valleys and the mountains that stand between us. And when we do that, when we finally give ourselves over, we hear in Isaiah, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. We know when we read scripture, sometimes it doesn't make sense until you read it the next day and all of a sudden it becomes clear. Somehow we've taken an obstacle out of our eyes, out of our way, and we see it. The glory of the Lord revealed. <coughs> now during the Advent, we get to prepare all our people, all our friends, all our families, so that they can receive the same thing. Those that still live in the wilderness, we've got to make it easy for them. And we do that just like Isaiah tells us in verse 9. He says, you who bring good news, all you guys, bring the good news. Go up high on a mountain. Get up to where everybody can hear you, where everyone can see you. And don't be shy about it. He says, you guys who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voices with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. That's all we have to say because they don't know. We get these little kids in Awana and they have no idea who God is. One of their first questions is, who created God? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got to start in the beginning. And we do. We start in the beginning. And we show them. And then they learn. I don't know how many times parents come to drop their kids off or pick them up from Awana and they say, they love coming here. They really look forward to it. Yes, because they're finding out about their God. Now what would happen, Mom and Dad, if you found out the same thing? Don't you want that for yourselves? We gotta work on that. We gotta work on that. But we're the ones who bring the good news. We are the only ones who can say we know him. Just like Goofy Elf is, Jesus, I know him! You can say the same thing, right? Right, right, right. Well, what are you waiting for? Jesus, I know him! That's still pretty weak, but you get the idea, right? You have to say it with enthusiasm. And why wouldn't you want to? They don't call it good news for nothing. Because you've got nothing else to worry about, right? You put all that other stuff behind you, and you can say, I know him. When you get home tonight, get on the web and see how Elf says about how he knows Santa. That's the way we should say that. Isaiah 49. You who bring good news, lift up your voice. Do not be afraid to say, here is your God. And in verse 10, he says, See, the Lord God will come with power. Try to envision who he's talking about. And his arm will rule for him. He is bringing the reward he will give to everyone for what he has done. When Jesus comes, he's bringing salvation with him. He's bringing that reward for what he has done. Not for what we did, for what he has done. That's why they call Isaiah the fifth gospel. Because Jesus is all over the earth. Our Lord Jesus comes with the power to save us if we would just believe in Him. That's all we have to do, right? Jesus brings His reward, the guarantee of salvation. It's the only place we can get it from because of what Jesus has done for us. What does Jesus tell us in John 14? He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Clear as day. There's only one way. And the clincher, so we know who Isaiah is talking about, look at verse 11. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. It's obvious Isaiah is talking about Jesus. He's talking about the power of salvation for the things that he did. He's telling us that he's going to be the shepherd leading the lost. Perfect. In our second reading, Mark references the Old Testament prophets Isaiah and Malachi. He's actually, he's, he gives all credit to Isaiah, but he's actually um, talking about Malachi's writing too. He tells us in verse 1, 
This is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. But if you look at scriptures, like I said, he's really talking about Isaiah and Malachi's writing. He's combining Isaiah, the greatest prophet, but he's also combining Malachi, who's the last prophet that the Israelites heard from for 400 years. 400 years until John the Baptist came. God says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Clearly talking about Jesus. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way for me. Because God the Father never comes down to earth. He comes down to earth as Jesus. John the Baptist was his messenger preparing the way for Jesus. And then the Father reinforces the same message in the second part of verse 3.1. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant. If you break it down, it gets really cool. Suddenly, like I said to the children, remember when Mary visited Elizabeth. Neither John or Jesus were born. But Joseph, John can sense Jesus next to him. And he jumped for joy. That's how suddenly it was. Because John is just a little bit older than Jesus. The Lord you are seeking will come. Hebrews for years and hundreds of years and thousands of years were waiting for Jesus anxiously. And John showed it. He couldn't even contain himself. He couldn't even wait to be born to start worshiping. He leapt for joy. Here's what we hear in Luke chapter 1, verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Having never experienced personally leaping in the womb, I can, I, it's probably pretty substantial, right? Yeah. 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 I can imagine. <laughs> So she was filled with the Holy Spirit too because she knew if John is jumping for joy that something really great must be happening. Man. You see how the Old Testament and the New Testament are just intertwined? We have to read them together. And when John came, he practiced the baptism of the repentance of sins. Now, Jews never did that before. What they would do is they would baptize Gentiles who wanted to become Jews, but they never baptized of repentance. So John's doing something brand new here. And he had to, because people had to get ready for Jesus. The, these two readings were given to us today because this is what we need to do. We need to prepare the way for our friends and family. We need to shout from the highest mountain that God is your God too. Not just ours. He's not something that we're just going to hold on to for ourselves. We actually have to share it. We have to do what God tells us in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, where he says, O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. And like Elf, we're going to say what? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, I know him. That's what I'm on here. Start next week. Well, start tomorrow. Okay. Our Father.